Hello and welcome to this webinar on error handling. It is the fifth part in my mini series on error handling. It is also the last part of this mini series and it is also the last webinar in this season of dialogue webinars. Let's briefly go over what we have covered in the previous episodes. Part 1 was about the very basics of error, hand error handling. Uh, we looked at the trap control structure and the codes involved in identifying specific errors and the basic system names for dealing with those identities. In part 2 we talked about Quattrap and getting more information about an error from Quattdmx. In part 3, we talked about uh, raising your own errors using Quad Signal and some techniques involved with that. And finally, in part 4, we talked about customizing the behavior when an error ha happens uh, for debugging and for runtime purposes, as well as collecting information about the error that happened. And you can find, as always, a collection of uh, all these previous webinars and eventually also this one on dialogue.tv. Now at the very end of the previous webinar in this series I spoke about the scope of errors happening inside defense um, and in that connection uh, I spoke about what I called capsules. Unfortunately I ran into some technical problems when I spoke about capsules in Tradfins. So therefore, I'll go over this a bit again. When we have a Tradfin, and inside the Tradfin, Tradfin we have a Quad Signal, then uh, the Quad Signal is going to bubble up, so to say, an error out of the current capsule and a Tradfin itself is a capsule. This means that if, as in this case, we have a trap control structure, then you might think that because Quad Signal is inside that control structure, anything that happens that causes an error inside the colon trap structure would be caught by the colon trap. But that's not so, because Quad Signal signals an error up, or bubbles an error up out of the current capsule. And the Tradfin, as I said, is a capsule. So now, when we call the inner function, the trap control structure is ignored, and the error 256, a custom error in our case, then leaves the defin, it leaves the Tradfin, and because there's nothing else catching it, it gets displayed in the session as an error 256. Let's insert another function. This function we'll call outer, and outer calls inner. Now when we call outer, execution progresses from outer to inner. Inside inner we enter the trap control structure. We signal up an error 256. The trap control structure in the inner function is ignored, but the outer one is not ignored. And therefore, instead of having a visible error, we print the message trapped outside. How can we prevent this behavior? Let's look closely at the line that actually raises the error, the quad signal 256. If we take the function quad signal and we wrap it in a little defin, then a defin that appears inside a tradfin is in itself a capsule. And quad signal will now leave this tiny inner capsule, and now it has done its job of leaving one capsule. Therefore, the trap in the inner function, the tradfin, does have an effect. Let's try it. So we call the function inner, 
quad signal takes the 256, which is the value of omega, and leaves its capsule, the defen. And this allows the colon trap in the function inner to take effect. Execution continues with the handling, which is trapped inside the message being printed, and that which is what we wanted. If we instead we call the outer function, then execution progresses from the outer to the inner. We go into this inner defen, which is its own capsule. Quad signal leaves that inner capsule. We end up in back in our inner function, and the trap has an effect. We do trapped inside. So that's what I wanted to go over in the last uh, episode of the series, but it didn't quite work out. There you go. Now, let's look at what we're going to go over new stuff today. We have previously dealt only with errors, but I have briefly mentioned that there are other types of event events. In fact, there are interrupts and exceptions, and that's the bulk of what I'm going to go over today. Once I'm done with that, then we'll look at cleaning up after yourself to eradicate every trace of the fact that an error happened. And finally, I'll ask you, my dear viewer and listener, to come with your opinion on a design question that we have. More about that at the very end of the webinar. Without further ado, special events. So what we've been dealing with in the first four parts of the series has been what we called errors. Every type of error has an error number between 1 and 999. Um, only in the first lower 100 are the built-in errors that APL primitives and system functions, etc. use. However, you can use the higher numbers for your own things. You can trap them either with using their specific numbers or you can use zero to mean all of them. Beyond 999, there are what we call interrupts. Now, they all have a number from 1,000 up. In fact, there are only eight specific ones defined, and you can't do any custom ones. And just like with the errors, where you can trap all of them with a zero, you can trap all the interrupts separately with 1,000. So if you do a colon trap zero, that does not trap any interrupts. If you do colon trap 1000, does not trap any errors. If you want to trap absolutely everything, you have to write colon trap 0 1000. And similarly in defend guards and quad trap, etc. Finally, um, there is, we could call it a special case of the error. It is in the lower numbers, number 90, but it has a separate behavior from all the other errors. Um, and it's called an exception. We'll deal with that at the end. On to interrupts. As I said, there are only these specific ones from 1001 until 1008. Let's go to AppleCart to get a brief overview of what they are about. Here's AppleCart.info, and we'll write colon colon interrupt into the search field, colon colon being like the marker for um, a guard and for error numbers, and then interrupt, and then list us all the interrupts that we have. And we can see here um, some of them are very technical, um, and many of them you might never actually experience. The main ones I'm going to deal with right here are the ones that are called the weak interrupt and uh, the strong interrupt. The difference between a weak and a strong interrupt is how um, how invasive the interrupt is, and conversely, from the APL interpreter's perspective, how quickly does it need to deal with it? A strong interrupt will even stop in the middle of the computation of a primitive if it's considered safe to do so. And whereas a weak interrupt will uh, wait until the primitive is done and um, not be busy with something else. Let's demonstrate how this works. 
with a little function. So we start off with the frame for it, and the first thing we're going to do is wait for one second. Then we're going to discard the result of quadl, which is just the amount of time that was actually elapsed when we asked for a specific time. We take the argument and increment it, print that to the session, and recurse. So this function, as it's written now, will run in an infinite loop. Every time we're finished writing the current incremented value, we're going to call the function itself on the result of that on the incremented value, which then increments it further. So if we were to call it with zero, it will print, uh, it will wait a second, print one, wait a second, print two, wait a second, and so on. And with no obvious way to stop it. Uh, if we were to issue an interrupt then, uh, then what would happen is that APL would write into the session that an interrupt has happened um, with an error message. But we don't want that to happen. We want to stay in control. So we add an error guard, or actually in this case, an event guard, we could say. Number 1000, catch every type of interrupt. We could have also written 1001, 1002, 1003, and so on. And when that triggers, then we're going to take the argument, which was the last number that we got around to printing, and prepend a bit of a message there. Note uh, that this becomes a proper result to the function. So even though an interrupt has happened, the function keeps running, and it can take further action. It could, in fact, recurse again, stay in the loop. But then it would be a function that's truly difficult to stop. Because when you try to interrupt it, it will keep going. Sometimes you need this, but you need to be careful about it. So in this case, it immediately returns, but it returns with a value. And then we can call this function with an argument, say 0. So now we're going to print 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, to show you that the final message we get when it gets interrupted is indeed a proper result, we're going to take that result and prepend a bit more of the message, the word i. So in the end we should get to i got to and the number that we got to. Okay, we're ready to run this. Let's uh, get the stopwatch ready so we can see that it indeed prints every second and that we can stop it again. So we're going to press enter and we can see that it's printing numbers. We open the menu, action, then interrupt, and that's it. It stopped after six seconds. And six number gets printed out. It printed out the message at the end, returned the message at the end. I got to six. Here's another example. This is a function to drill you on a mathematical equation. So it's going to ask you a hard math problem and um, then it's going to use QuoteQuad to prompt you for some text coming in and comparing that to the actual computed result. If you answered correctly, it would return a 1. If you answered wrong, it would return a 0. Let's try it. We're giving it a dummy argument because we are not actually using Omega anywhere. And the problem here is it gives you enough time to sit and think about things to see and, and to do all the carries and make sure you get the right result. We want to stress the user. We want to put him under time pressure to answer uh, this equation. How can we do that? One way to do it is to use the system variable quad RTL. That stands for response time limit. It takes a number of seconds and for QuoteQuad and for various other types of input and incoming information, it sets a limit as to how long we will wait for the input. If the input comes within the allotted time, then QuoteQuad in this case acts like normal. If not, then a special type of event happens, which is the timeout interrupt. And that we can trap. So if the timeout happens, we need a guard for it. Let's insert a guard, 1006, that's timeout, 
and then we return the value to slow rather than a1 or a0. Let's try it. We're going to give the user five seconds to answer the question. Stop what's ready. We're going to stop at five seconds. Let's go. And there you go. Too slow after exactly five seconds. So here's a way to use uh, interrupts, uh, not because something external happened, but rather as just a part of the flow of your function. That's it for the interrupts. You can go and explore the documentation for the other types of interrupts to see when they happen. Let's look at exceptions. Um, in order to demonstrate this, I'm going to write a silly little function. Um, it's going to be a function that checks whether a given date, given as three numbers, year, month, day, is a valid date or not. Now, I call it silly because we pretty much have this built in today. Uh, as of version 18, we have quad dt, and if you give it the right type of arguments, it will do this check for you and return uh, a boolean whether or not the date is valid. However, bear with me for doing a silly implementation of this just for demonstration purposes. The th first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the argument and we're going to treat it as a timestamp, like Quartier style. Year, month, day works fine. You don't have to supply the time. And then we're going to conceptually convert it to that very same format. So the negative one as left argument to quad dt is that same format, the quartiers style format. Of course, conversion from one format to itself is not really going to do anything other than appending any missing elements. However, if the date is invalid, quad dt will throw an error. Again, this is silly because we have it built in, but if this is just to demonstrate what will happen we catch the error. We're going to discard the result because we don't actually need the converted result. Indeed, it's the same as the input, pretty much. We're going to instead return the word valid. If, however, quad dt rejects the input, it's going to throw an error. And we set up an error guard, catching all the errors, and um, as we explored quad DMX in the second part of my mini-series. Um, quad DMX is a namespace. It has various members, including the message, which is a human-friendly way of stating what the problem was in the code. So that's what we're going to return. Let's try it. Let's check February 29th of 2020. That was a leap year, so we get valid. However, February 29 of this year, 2021, um, that would throw an error, and then we get the text from the DMX message, which is invalid date time. Very nice. Now, the point of this, and where I want to get to, is doing the exact same thing, but instead of using our built in quad DT, we're going to use .NET. The first thing we need to do, of course, is activate .NET by setting quite using for the system. This allows us to directly use anything that's in the core library of .NET. Rather than using quad DT, we're going to create a new datetime object, a .NET datetime object, and um, it will take a year, month, day as the argument, the constructor for the datetime. If it cannot create a date time based on these parameters, it's going to throw an error. Everything proceeds as we did before. Let's try it out. And it kind of worked. I mean, yeah, it did. But the DMX message here has nothing to do with the fact that the date time couldn't be created. Instead, whenever an error happens during a call to .NET, the DMX message, which is the APL side of things, will have this text, a .NET exception has occurred. It also does give us a hint, check quad exception for details. 
it in fact happens to be that quite exception in after such an error has happened is an object much like quite DMX, but it instead of containing the characteristics and uh, of the error that happened on the APL side, it contains the characteristics of the error as it happened on the .NET side. So we can take our function and slightly amend it, just changing quad DMX to quad exception. There is in fact a member called message. And now, if you run it again, then we have a much nicer message. It's a bit long-winded, but that's not our fault. Microsoft has decided that this is what it should look like when we cannot create a date time. There is a lot of stuff in quad exception. Uh, similar to what we did in the second part of the series about quad DMX, uh, we can go in and list the members of quad exception. So here we're getting all the types of members that are there, and we can see the list of them. Lots of those there. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of them because that really belongs in the documentation for .NET. You can look it up. However, just as an example, and uh, the source that is the library that had this error, and that is MS Core lib. That is the the core, the basic parts of .NET because we only specified quite using get system. This is the only thing we can access. And another one is the target site. This explains a bit more what actually happened. Yes, we were in the process of creating a datetime object. In that process, we had to convert these three integers given to a tick count because the internal representation for .NET datetime objects is a number of ticks since their epoch. And that's where the exception happened. There is no tick number that corresponds to February 29th of 2021 because that is an invalid date. It, that point in time never happened. Again, refer to the documentation of, for .NET to know about these other parts in the exception report. So now that we've gone through um, errors, we've gone through interrupts and sometimes they can contain information that you don't want to persist it could be large it could be sensitive it could reveal technical things about your application that you don't want to there might be some reasons why you want to clean up after yourself in fact you can do that it's very simple we let's say we have a division by zero error we can see that um, after the error has happened, we have an error number, we have contents inside quad DMX here, the extended error number, and by simply calling quad signal with the error code zero, which is not the number of any particular error, that has a side effect, there's no direct effect, nothing's even printed, but it has a side effect of clearing all those system states. So if we try to ask for the value of quad DMX, we get nothing visible. It's an empty matrix. And if we try to ask for the error number and the extended error number, then they're all zeros, which are not numbers that they could otherwise have after an error. There is no error number zero. It's as simple as that. If you need to clean up, you might never need this, but if you do, then quad signal zero is how you do it. And finally, um, as promised, I'll give you the opportunity to express your opinion about some design work. The thing is that we discussed in uh, the very first of these webinars uh, the error number and how you could convert from an error number to its error message using quad em. However, how about the opposite? So conceptually, it's the inverse of the quad em function, which takes error numbers and return error messages. That, however, is not actually valid code. We looked at various ways of doing this. 
And one of them was to define a function that can do it. And it's implemented by by doing all the conversions from numbers to messages and then just storing them. This particular implementation of it also saves you from having to type the word error when that's relevant. It allows you to write things in maybe a bit neater way. Like here, we use literal phrase error, rank, length, or you could implement it without taking out the word error, in which case you could write trap and then your function name and then rank error and length error, for example. Having to define this function is a bit clunky and is not particularly efficient to do this either. So question is, how could we make this neater to use? And there are different ways. That's where I'd, we'd like your feedback. So coming back to today's world, um, let's say we have the error numbers four and five, we'll convert them to messages, print them out, rank error, length error. One way that this could be implemented would be to allow uh, the power operator, negative one, on um, quad EM. And this is similar to what some primitives do. You can run them in reverse. You can have them take the reverse action. So if the forward action is to convert from numbers to messages, the um, reverse error message would be to take messages and return numbers. Another way you can see the power operator is as in asking um, what argument would I need to feed to QuadDM so that I would get this result. So the result is rank error and length error and and the power operator then answers back the argument you need to give to QuadDM and would be 4 and 5. Another way we could do this uh, would simply be to make QuadDM self-inverse. This is similar to QuadUCS. QuadUCS can take some numbers, which are uh, points in the Unicode s character set, and converts them to ca the corresponding characters. It can also take characters and then converts them to the corresponding numbers. It's easy for QuadUCS to know which direction are we going because one is a character to number, the other one is number to character. So we can see in the type which way to go. Same thing with QuadEM. You can see if we're giving it char a character vector or multiple character vectors, we need to convert to numbers. If we're giving them numbers, we need to convert to character vectors. You might be concerned about the depth of the result but that's already in the design of QuadDM. Namely, when we convert from numbers to character vectors, the depth increases. And you might then ask, um, does a single number become an enclosed character vector, or does it become an, a simple character vector? But since that's already there, that's not a problem uh, for our design here. Um, whether or not an, a single character vector is enclosed or not, it will still result in a simple numeric scalar. And this can therefore be, we can work consistently. A third option would be something entirely different, if you have an idea for that. And lastly, we might even be able to treat character vectors as their corresponding error number. So instead of writing colon trap 4, you could write colon trap rank error. It's a possibility. However, I'd love to hear your opinion about this. Maybe you can come up with something entirely different from all of this that would be a neater design. Please do let me know. You can write to me, adam at dialogue.com. Um, as this is the last webinar of the year, we'll be continuing in January. Then uh, try to get your feedback back to me 
by the end of the year. If you have any questions, um, then feel free to write them in the chat right now. I'll be here to answer and I'll be joining the chat shortly as well. Meanwhile, um, overview of what we've gone over today. You can wrap quad signal to create an, a temporary capsule that can then uh, be left with quad signal and keeping the error inside the current transfer. We've learned about interrupts, which are in the thousands range, and you can get them all with 1000. Exceptions is a special error number 90, and you can get the details about it from quad exception. And finally, the reset from quad signal is zero. Don't forget that you can get the number for any given error message by searching for it on Apple Cart. Use two colons to make sure you get an error. And finally, with no questions having come in, here's an overview of the upcoming webinars. So the BAA uh, webinars, which are open sessions, unless a specific subject is decided in time for them to begin, are going to continue until the middle of December. And uh, the next thing from us at Dialog is going to be the Dialog 21 user meeting. There will be more information coming up on that um, shortly. However, already now you can see the program with um, the presentations that are going to be there. So that's on the 8th and 9th of November. Also note that for all those places in the world that have daylight savings times, that is going to take to end between uh, the BAA session on the 21st of October and the Dialog user meeting at November 8th. So make sure to get the times correctly Other than that, we'll see you back at the next Dialog webinar on January 20 next year. Thank you so much for watching.